Okay. Dinesh, you're on mute. Let's maybe wait okay. for a minute or two if, uh, you know, these, uh, because Jerry can't get in, he's just a message. And uh, so the system will not recognize me. I say. think we should get going. Uh, they should visit time with Leah. Yeah. Yes, now I think, yeah, I think Mr. Jerry. The time will be up, that's my fear. No, but Mr. Jerry has, I think, so attended as a, uh, as, as, I think not as a speaker, he's got in as an attendee. So he needs to get in as a speaker. Oh, yeah, I've got a, I've got a thing in here saying oh, I'm an attendee but not a speaker. That's from Jerry. That's yes. That's my screen. We'll just have to... Uh, on Bindu's disappeared again. Yeah. You know, it's very fast. We, we can start for sure, but uh, sure. I think he's longer. Sorry, can't hear you. Let's Let's start. Yeah. Okay. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, I can hear you. It's gone again. We could start. Yeah, but I can't see you. Can you see me? Yes, very clearly. Yeah. yeah. Very clearly. Okay, I can't, but should we start then? Yes, we can. Only the Mr. Halton has gotten as a uh, okay. um, attendee. He should get in as a speaker. I've just sent him a message. Yes, we could start. Uh, Dinesh, bye. We wasted 10 minutes. Yes, okay, let's start. I can't see you. My apologies, but I'm starting. Greetings from India to all participating in this event today. It is my privilege to introduce you to stellar panel with us to share their insights on how can FDI be boosted to spur the economic and social development of developing countries that are most impacted by the pandemic induced recession. A panel is surprised. Cheers. Our other illustrious panelists are, uh, as I see today just now, uh, we have. Uh, Ms. Ann Nalder, uh, the Chief Executive Officer, Small Business Association of Australia, and Mr. Stephen Phillips, Director General of Invest Hong Kong. Friends, as we unlock a period of partial yet yo-yo recovery from the pandemic-induced recession is underway. So countries, corporates, and global supply chains are striving to move from demand destruction to value creation. Currently, the economic propeller of domestic growth in most countries rests on one pillar, which is government spending on infrastructure. I've noticed this across the board, more or less, especially in developing countries. Whereas consumption and investments, which constitute 85% of GDP, are missing from the GDP component, while services need a lifeline, services sector like aviation and hospitality. While FDI has been a prime propeller of growth, OECD projections for 2020 suggest that even under the most optimistic scenario, FDI flows to developing countries will fall more than 40% in 2020. Further, 
as FDI entails a long 15 to 20 year investment perspective or the horizon, geopolitical considerations hold as much weightage as the ease of doing business in a host country. The dilemma we all know is that no more can trade equations be separated from geopolitics, so we can only interoperate amongst friendly nations. To estimate the size of the total global pie, the investment pool around the world stands at 45 trillion annually. Recent MNC profit alerts are an early warning sign of their curtailed capacity to deploy in new investments as the top 5,000 MNCs worldwide, which account for most of global FDI, have projected earnings which are revised downwards by 40%. So lower profits are therefore hurting reinvested earnings, which account for a good 50% of the FDI. Further, early indicators confirm that new greenfield investment projects and cross-border M&As have dropped by more than 50%. As also global project finance, which is an important source of investment in infrastructure and vital for funding projects in developing countries, new deals have fallen here also by 40%. <coughs> I'm coming to this while I open, uh, open it up with you all. With the rise of geopolitical uncertainties and the declining rate of multilateral institutions, it is imperative for developing countries to have strategic fallback plans by forging strong bilateral, trilateral or plurilateral equations with what is now known as the middle order countries or a consortia of democracy. This is the only way to lift all ships because it is important for developing nations to regain momentum towards driving GDP pre-COVID levels of five-year averages minimum, which was at about 8%. Empirically, whenever multilateralism has stagnated, regional trade agreements have taken over as they did in the 1980s. Finally, the vital point in today's contracting FDI scenario is that the cost of borrowing is at its lowest. Even profit, despite it being at, at its lowest, even profitable companies and governments of developed nations are overcautious in, and they prefer to invest only in high-rated investment-grade companies, uh, countries. So in view of these headwinds, may I open up the discussions and request our esteemed panelists to compare notes on how each country is coping with their economic response to the problem. Uh, who would like to start? Um, should we start with you, And <laughs> oh, Ladies first. Yeah, ladies first. <laughs> I have a long time. <laughs> From, uh, hello, hello, everybody, and I'm greatly honoured to be here Welcome. Um, the pandemic uh, has decimated people's lives and their livelihoods, and <coughs> I'm going to be speaking about from Australia's point. Uh, we have been very, very lucky uh, that we've had very, very few deaths and very few infections, but this has been due to very, very strict lockdowns and therefore business has been decimated, and I mean decimated. And so uh, the government is spending um, billions of dollars never heard of before in Australia's history. Uh, and even with all, like we're talking about three, four hundred billion dollars to get the economy moving. Um, they, they did a lot of things like some other European countries where they provided... Um, uh, revenue to help businesses keep on staff, etc. Uh, otherwise, we would have a very, very uh, a worse situation with unemployment than what we have at the moment. Our figures might seem low at the moment, but in reality, we've probably got 10, 15 percent, maybe even a bit more. When you start counting people who are underemployed, 
there were many people that missed out on getting <coughs> to help them stay in the workforce. So it is a very, very large number. And so the government is working and providing and doing things to assist business owners. Now, okay. yeah, so it's, it's, uh, it's not, um, we're lucky in some ways, but we're very unfortunate in other ways. And we can't, uh, and only a few people can leave Australia at the moment. If you are an Australian citizen, uh, you have to, it is very, very difficult to leave Australia. So we're basically still in a fairly rigid lockdown situation. And that, of course, um, with the pandemic, we found, uh, we found weaknesses in our supply chains, like many countries did. And that is going to, and that is making us rethink things, which I think is a good thing at the end of the day, because I think worldwide, uh, many countries face the same situation. Sure. So despite now, once we, by about March of next year, and it's due to a number of factors, I believe that we will see and get a truer picture as to what is taking place in Australia. At the moment, we see figures going up and down, Not things are not too bad. It are, is, as we said, a yo-yo recovery. It is a yo-yo recovery for sure. And it's going to remain that, I think, till, the, till there's a vaccine. And yeah. we well, well, yeah. well, we're going to have a better indication, I believe, uh, by about March of next year as to where we are travelling as an economy because there are many, many businesses that are hanging out there until the Christmas period to see how trading will take place. And I think those that uh, will find it's not working or trading is very slow, I think they will make decisions to exit. You know, they, they will close up their businesses. So that's why I say we will have a better indication, I believe, by about March of next year. I don't think it's going to be a pretty picture because we have about, for example, uh, the government has done uh, uh, created a situation where if a business um, is insolvent and owes about um, under $1 million, they will be able to be protected for a while, whereas in other words, a liquidator cannot just simply go in and wipe, wind them up, etc. But that business has to be an incorporated business like it's got to be a company but where there's a big issue and we're going to look into this as well is where you've got sole traders and I'm talking about a, a structure as a sole trader because there's about a million and a half of them and they don't have any asset protection so these are the situations that we are looking at closely which is very very worrying um, and so um, I think there will be some serious consequences later like uh, in the early it is after the after effects of the of the downturn oh yeah see see what happened with australia we had last year we had the um bushfires which were very very serious they created a huge problem right around many states of australia that has a, ha had a great effect then we had floods then we've had the prolonged drought no, that we're and now the virus. So, so it's all had a very, very devastating effect on the economy. Cumulative, we've also entered the pre uh, the corona era with a lot of backlog of problems with our mm -hmm. own uh, economy and our banks. Am I right, Dimitri? Yes, um, Binduji. Uh, before that, I have Mr. Jerry Halton on the speaker phone. I have connected him. So mm. since he could not get connected, you know, through the uh, app, so mm. maybe we could hear his views first. Uh, uh, okay, sure. Yes, Mr. Halton. Welcome, Mr. Halton, though we can't see you. Good. Well, thank you. It's good morning from America. It's good morning, and I hope you're doing better. Uh, I am. So, uh, uh, just I thought uh, one or two things about foreign direct investment that we've seen in New York City. Uh, one of my colleagues is uh, the advisor to uh, Mayor de Blasio and the city of New York on foreign direct investment. So he studied it a lot. And you would think New York is an easy place for foreign direct investment to arrive. But we discovered that uh, a lot of investors were essentially flying right over New York and heading to San Francisco and Silicon Valley. So the rule number one on foreign direct investment for me is you need to market yourself. 
You need to talk about your country. You need to say what you're doing. And you need to be bold about that because the investors have only so much time to decide where to go and who to invest in. So two is, I've worked a lot in India for the last 10 years. And first as an educator, and India has been a really tough place for educators to uh, come in begin to bring foreign capital as direct investment to uh, help build universities. That's why do you say that, uh, why do you say that, Mr. Halton? The regula regulations made it impossible for a, a university in America to come to India and have a charter. So there was no possibility even of setting up a university from America and bring the investors with you to build it. Now that's changed a bit, but not very much. So it's so one place that India is losing foreign direct investment is just in having educators show up and begin educating young people. But the third thing I think I would say about foreign direct investment that isn't directly financial, but I think is very important, is the building of a young entrepreneurial set of uh, young people who build companies who use research from universities to create new products is one of the best ways to attract foreign direct investment because that begins a ladder of growth in which as the company grows, new capital arrives, new markets are created, new products are created, and that begins a cycle of virtue as you go from startup to venture capital, to private equity, to an IPO. And one of the keys, and this is interesting, this is where Russia misses a real opportunity. It has a lot of capital. That capital held in the hands of a few people never, almost never invest in young companies. And yet, if they would invest in those young companies, they begin to excite young people. They create new value. They begin to show there's something worth investing in in your country. So I'm a big advocate of three things. Universities that do great research that help society. Two, young people getting their hands on that research that create new services and products, education, health care, housing, transportation. Three, capital then that supports those young people, that's venturesome enough to say, I will work with you. And fourth, big companies that buy out ultimately those young companies because that then puts new capital into the cycle, tells all the world, if you come to my country, in this case we're talking India, come to India and you invest in young people, you'll see your money multiply the same way we see multiply, money multiply in Silicon Valley. So I'm a big advocate of what I would call an innovation economy as the best way to get foreign direct investment. But may I ask you in the China minus one policy, Mr. Halton, where would you go after uh, after China? Where are you? Where where is American industry? Uh, I mean, a lot of it is going to Vietnam. But uh, according I, to you, which are the ideal destinations? Yeah, that's a really excellent question. I, I think it's obvious that under the current administration. Uh, we're not we're not doing much with China. We're giving China a signal we're not going to do much. TikTok is a good example. But we could go to India. But the more I work with India, look at the articles. I compare the ability of China to produce a stream of goods to become parts of American products. That same manufacturing capacity isn't equal in India. On the software side, India is very strong, and there's been lots of great connections between Emphasis, Kata, and others that's been very productive. But on the manufacturing side, there's still some growth to be done because the, the quality of products that will go into an iPhone, quality of products that will go into a Dell computer, will have to be at a much stronger level. China learned how to do that. India can learn how to do that. But India needs to learn to do that. That's a step still to be taken. Mm -hmm. Point well taken. Uh, what about you? What is your take, uh, uh, Philip? Um, well, sitting here in Hong Kong, maybe I can sort of give a view 
from the heart of Asia. Um, obviously, um, COVID and geopolitics are interrelated and Inter playing out very yes. much Indeed. in Asia, in China. Um, but to give everybody a feel for what I'm seeing in terms of the inbound um, investment FDI into Hong Kong, we're currently running at about 70 percent of what we would expect in a normal, decent year. Um, so actually, it's reasonably robust. Um, and that is interest that we're seeing really from across the entire globe. Um, we're also seeing very strong capital inflows um, for listings that are taking place in Hong Kong. Um, some of those because of listings moving from the US um, to Hong Kong with Chinese companies um, moving their listing. I think what's driving a lot of this interest in Asia still is the um, comparatively strong growth of China. Um, China will be the single largest market that will show growth this year, probably about 1.3% growth of GDP. UNCTAD's forecasting 8.1% for next year. Um, and with COVID under control in China, um, business is more or less back to normal um, and operating within the country. Um, in your opening remarks, you talked about intra-regional stuff. That's also something that I'm seeing very strongly within Asia. Um, in we part, it's the supply chains moving around, yeah. um, but also with the growth of um, countries within ASEAN, we're seeing many of those companies looking at the mainland markets. Um, so growing trade and investment within Asia itself, in particular developments in an area called the Greater Bay Area in southern China is capturing a lot of attention. But, but overall, what I would say is we're still seeing a lot of global interest, um, even from distant markets. So the Middle East, South America, um, relatively strong growth all but from a low base and our more traditional um, source of investment projects, Europe and North America, we continue to see quite strong growth. Mm -hmm. So um, whilst it's incredibly challenging, um, I see some bright spots on the landscape. Dinesh Ji, what is your, uh, what is your worldview uh, in the India perspective? Sure. So first of all, I would like to thank um, and congratulate Dr. Frank Victor for uh, this fantastic, uh, you know, extraordinary event. That is indeed an honor. Absolutely, we, we join you in that, uh, Dinesh Ji, because as I said, that is the need of the hour because we need global brain power to, uh, you know, interrelate and have these kind of uh, fruitful dialogues uh, because no country can handle this crisis alone. And I'm so grateful to both you and uh, Dr. Frank for having put this platform together where we are meeting more often. Thank you, Manuji. So my, I have a different uh, take on this. And uh, I feel that um, we have moved away from the story of globalization and gone towards uh, protectionism. Uh, it all started, uh, I can say, somewhere around 2008 after the financial crisis in the yeah. uh, U.S. Uh, the, most of the banks and the financial institutions got back to their uh, home country instead of getting to the other, uh, you know, uh, uh, geographies where they were. Uh, but at the same time, what what they saw was uh, the the uh, emerging markets turned out to be much better in performing than the developed uh, markets, and uh, so. Um, so I feel that there is there is tremendous uh, potential still in the emerging market and especially India to attract uh, foreign direct investments. Uh, so uh, between 2008 to 2013, there were a lot of um, negative, uh, you know, uh, FDI's uh, interest in uh, uh, many developed countries, and at, it is at that time that the uh, emerging economies picked up. Uh, what I have seen is India has done something fantastic, which uh, uh, you know, in the last uh, uh, couple of years we were we were the largest importers of uh, 
telecom, solar, and and uh, defense. But if you see in the last couple of months, we are the largest. Uh, we have created a very large manufacturing hubs and also uh, exporting, uh, you know, uh, telecom equipments. So because there are a lot of uh, very good incentives uh, offered, uh, you know, by the government. If you come on the solar part, we were hundred percent dependent on solar panels. Yeah. Today, in a couple of you know short period of time. We have started manufacturing solar panels, and not just manufacturing. We are exporting. We used to, uh, you know, import from China, but if you look at the quality today, India is giving much better quality. And you would not believe that the best insurance insurers are insuring our solar panels for 20 years, which is which is really a very big achievement which India has done. The same is with uh, defense. We are fully dependent on uh, import for defense today. We have uh, several states that have come up with manufacturing up. So I feel that yes, there is there is lot to be uh, done. But without India, has really performed well. And uh, the the uh, slogan by the prime minister, where uh, I mean, I, he's called it Atman Nirbhar Bharat, and you can translate it. Into which which is a self-reliant country. Just to explain to you what our prime minister wants. And India does. He wants us to turn inwards. Absolutely, the the domestic consumption and the production is tremendous uh, as far as India is concerned. We are offering good incentives to manufacturing companies who are setting base. We have seen a good amount of investments coming in also. uh the covid has changed uh, the paradigm of uh, you know uh, of the world but i feel that as far as india is concerned we would be leading in pharmaceutical and also in the production of uh, vaccine so uh, if you go to compare between vietnam and india for invest- uh, investments coming out of china um in vietnam is just one country and you know there is not much of choice If you look at India, we we have about forty two states, just like America, that has got fifty two states, and each state is marketing itself very strongly and uh, trying to getting investment. So every state has its own strength, their own skill develop, uh, skills, uh, you know, uh, I can say um, opportunities and excellence. So uh, we we have uh, we we have uh, mustered a lot of foreign investments, and we will continue to do that. i think what is posing a big problem uh, for even people wanting to buy distressed assets or take overs mergers acquisitions the real problem seems to be that one they're not able to travel and there is only availability rightly so of pre covid data before deciding when they doing their due diligence they need contemporary data so i think that is causing a big evaluation problem for uh, most countries i would would you agree philip and and um, yeah i think you know, how do you arrive at a, at a uh, as at a base valuation that is uh, viable to buy an asset what would you deem is a viable uh, uh, point to buy an asset well for sure um, valuation is very difficult in the current market and um, no doubt about it and certainly and yet we don't want predatory takeovers Co- correct um but certainly what i see in hong kong we're seeing a number of foreign investors looking at assets in hong kong whether fiscal or m&a deals um but there's a huge disparity between um the wants of the buyer um and the seller um and that goes to the heart of the issue that you raise about data uh, and the fundamentals of the valuation sure. um and i think that will continue for some time with um just so many different levels of uncertainty i i think if i may add i'd like to also offer a different viewpoint uh and this is looking at the future um as you know my interest lies with small business at small and medium enterprises and that is the way of the future there is a tendency to look at very very large corporations and investment and that's fine but we mustn't overlook that small and medium enterprises can be also viable because some of these are very solid uh businesses 
and they can offer a lot. If you think just between India and Australia alone, you're looking at about 40 million small businesses. Now, can you imagine if you set up a trade or investment between the lot? There is a lot that can be done in just that area alone. And right around the world, between 96% and 99.7% of businesses are small businesses. But as I said, often small businesses overlook because they are seen as irrelevant and they're too small. But I think there needs to be, uh, we need to look at new things and new thinking post coronavirus. How do we engage in, and that can be an in investment, in trade, in export, and so forth. Uh, for developing countries, small businesses are great because even if they go into business, it can alleviate it can uh, alleviate poverty. It can be very, very good for women, for example, because that can raise their standards and living standards, etc. So there is a lot to be looked at, and we need to look at not just the bigger end of town or always, but we need to look at the smaller enterprises because I think you'll find that is a market that has been ignored for too long. And I think they're a great opportunity. But they always start for funds and, and they need a lot of help. So right now we look they at do. the picture. You know, the smaller picture comes later. Or maybe it needs to go parallel. But what happens when there's this, uh, uh, we shrunk in size for demand. There's demand erosion. And there's a mismatch because um, while capital is cheap, uh, it's not uh, reaching the what the sector that you look after, which is what we call uh, MSMEs here. Yep, yep, exactly. So we, I, I believe it is a hu it would be a huge mistake to overlook that. And I think too, when we, when we look at um, FDIs, we need to be looking at we. I think we need to have a plan and to have new thinking. And I think if we can do that. Uh, and we also need to have safeguards in as well because we need to have investment by good companies, for example, good investment, because unless that investment uh, benefits the local population and the economy, it's not of great benefit. You know, long-term local population, um, if we talk particularly the labour class or the, the, the poorer classes, it's invariably the fallback has always been on infrastructure. Even after the global crisis of 2008, the fallback was local government spending money, domestic government spending money on infrastructure, for which we need international finance. All countries need it. Yes. I am very coming in on, he wants to make a comment. Yeah, please. Thank you. Yes, to follow up, to follow up uh, the Anne's comment about us, a small business. I, I do agree. Small business is a great source of opportunity. I think the exercise, especially in India, should be to help small business understand how to meet uh, global legal standards of uh, production, uh, agile production. Uh, if you look at the ability that we had with China to place an order have it be produced and shipped to America in surprisingly short time, whether it was fashion or electronics or other equipment, to match that capacity is one way to begin to bring foreign direct investment and increase demand. I realize we all have a domestic demand problem right now, but there's a lot going on in the world. And if India would begin to connect more rigorously, and Dinesh talked about how it's happening. I'm really pleased to hear what's happening in solar. Uh, that, what Dinesh described in solar, is it should be the model for any number of other industries, automobile manufacturing and parts, electronics. Uh, and again, I refer back to the view, the more you bring global education into India, the more those that knowledge, that technical knowledge of what works across the world will permeate all of your businesses. It's a case that India needs to not only be make India, I understand that. It's important to have a strong country. But linking with the rest of the world is the second piece of that. And I encourage an increase in that. It's happening already, Mr. Halton. I'm glad you're on the same page as us because India has seen a jump of 4x 
in uh, in the edtech startup space uh, here itself. Good, good. It's happening. Job, and add to, add to our job. education se segment, aside from the population, the young population, we are now going to have lifelong learners, which is a new segment world over, which is the mid-age segment up to the 60s, 70s, who will want to carry on um, upskilling and learning. So uh, our market becomes almost double its size for edtech and, and for learning. What do you feel, Adinati? I agree. And by the way, just to say hello to Amitabh, who's a friend. So uh, it's good to have you working on this so hard. And I'll encourage you. Who's a friend? You. I'm going to drop. Amitabh Khan is a friend. Okay. So, uh, okay. I'm going to drop off again and listen. But thank you That's for getting me in. My pleasure. Nice. I, I just may unmute you now. So, uh, so my, oh, my take on. Um, sorry, you were saying something, Steve? You go ahead. Yeah. So I would very much echo what uh, Anna said uh, as far as the MSME concerned. And uh, we, I mean, the, you know, the MSME sector in India is contributing to nearly about 32% of the manufacturing. But if you look at in, in Europe, I mean, countries like Germany or Austria, Switzerland, they are more than about 97, 98%. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact is that, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, the government has given a very good stimulus to the MSMEs and, uh, you know, the uh, SMEs. So I feel that uh, post-COVID, it is going to be the innovation and the MSMEs who are going to drive uh, a, a great amount of business, uh, you know, for uh, uh, India. Uh, just to give an example, I was talking to a car manufacturer and he mentioned to me that just to make one car, you need 200 different components. And that doesn't come from one company. It comes from 200 different small and medium enterprises. The ancillaries, yeah. So so you can see the kind of, and India is one of the largest, if you look at uh, the automobile uh, you know, sector is concerned. So so we we are uh, going to a great extent. But yes, uh, what is needed for MSME at this stage is to survive is a good, fairly a good amount of uh, liquidity and you know, the capital also. Which again, I, I'm not just being too optimistic about India, but what I've seen in the last three, four months, many uh, MSME companies have gone to the stock exchange and they have used capital. Companies want to be debt free. They do not want to, uh, you know, have too much debt on their books. So they are find, finding very innovative uh, methods to raise capital. So I feel like, uh, you know, if, if we see more and more companies going to the uh, stock exchange, we'll have the MSME sector getting more vibrant also. And obviously, yes, there is an issue of demand, no doubt about it. So that that would be that's a global issue. A demand global. destruction that's is a global issue. That's a global issue. That's very much a global issue. Yes, Stephen, sorry, you say something. Yeah, re really echoing the comments around the importance um, of small um, and startup companies. Um, certainly what we see in Hong Kong um, is it's also a very important component of FDI. Um, about 35% of all startups in Hong Kong have got foreign co-founders. Um, so it's very significant, so significant actually that we've got a dedicated team that's in West Hong Kong just to look after those international um, startups. And they tie in as well to, I think, some of the um, hottest sectors with the most potential. Um, certainly when I look at Hong Kong in fintech, in AI, robotics, biomedicine, smart cities. Um, I think to that so it's the a commonality really of, the, of the champion sectors is, in, uh, is across the globe, more or less. What the sectors you are saying is, I think, across the globe, these are emerging as the champion sectors of the economy. I agree. What, what, what I'm, the point I'm trying to assert or reassert is that the startup and scale-ups from an FDI component are a very important part of that. Mm -hmm. So it's this point, it isn't just about the bigger, more established companies. Um, some yeah. of these nimble early stage companies are really having a significant impact. Mm -hmm. And would you yes, I agree. I, I agree. I, I agree. Would Mr. Halton like to come in or? Jerry would like to say something? I'll say a little bit more. Just a second. 
I'll say a little bit more. Uh, the question raised here by one of the uh, uh, people listening, uh, what's the best incentive to track good SMEs with manufacturing capabilities? Uh, I make the argument that the best thing to track them is uh, our cities that allow them to have a high quality of life. Uh, that to that, that means ability to get educated, ability to raise a family, ability to get to work without congestion, parks, a good life. And we see cities around the world doing this. They're basically attracting talent as the firm fundamental strategy. And that then leads to creation of new companies, small companies like Ann, Stephen, and Dinesh that everyone's talked about. But those small companies require a whole cohort of young people often young, they don't all have to be young, who have an energy and a, a city in which they can do this. Uh, Hong Kong's done that for often. Cities in India have done that. There's famous cities, Bangalore and others, that have really been good about attracting that talent. But that's, in, to my view, the key. Once you've got the talent and the city that keeps that talent happy, things happen. And what you described starts to take place. Small businesses get money, Big businesses buy them, young people get rich, young people invest in new things, and you have exactly what we want. Uh, so I focus on education, quality of the city, attracting young people. The rest begins to happen almost naturally. Well, uh, all good things in life come to an end. I think we, we seem to be coming to an end, though we could carry on ad infinitum. Uh, I think it's been so far an extraordinary interaction and a very insightful session. But uh, let's carry on this dialogue uh, offline sometime. Since it's showing time up and uh, we've just got to say adios. It's been, it's been a pleasure. And uh, really and thank, you, you, thank, thank you. Thank you so and much. We need to God yep. bless and stay safe and bye. Uh, Philip, bye Dinesh, bye, bye Alton. Get well soon, Mr. Alton. And and let's uh, let's continue the dialogue after. Sure, that. sure, certainly. Uh, do give us your inputs uh, via mail or something for India. I do yeah. write occasionally, and uh, yeah. even um, Dinesh ji can uh, take it forward. Pleasure meeting you, uh, uh, Mr. Philip. Also. Thank you. See you again. Thank, thank you, Dinesh. Thank you so much and thank you. Uh, thank uh, Dr. Frank also. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, -bye. thank you. Here I go. Are we still talking or we're going to switch no, off? We're done. Yeah. So let's stay in touch, and we are in touch. Uh, I know that. Uh, yeah. Stephen, let's be in touch, and uh, let's connect shortly. Yeah, and le and let let's draw up a plan, uh, as I call it, because and I think we need to have different thinking because yeah. nothing's going to be the same post coronavirus. Uh, that of that I am sure. Absolutely. And lovely meeting, you, Stephen. We need to keep in touch. Yeah, I should put you in touch with um, our team in Sydney, actually. Um, oh, I'll do that. Yeah, I, I'd li I'd like that because I think the more we put our heads together and come up with sound ideas, it's got to be better all round, hasn't it? Yeah, uh, and Dinesh, I've got a team in Mumbai as well, um, it, so maybe I can put you in touch with them. Excellent. Let's do that. I'll I'll send you a mail, um, and uh, we'll be in touch. Okay. Happy. Yeah. See you. Bye bye. Great. Take care. Bye, bye. bye everyone. Bye bye. 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 bye.